Story number one, turn it off. I'm an avid hiker and camper. I guess it's because I'm a socially awkward loner who enjoys solitude and silence. Being out in nature allows me to embrace that part of myself. I know what you're thinking. Hiking and camping alone is just asking for trouble. You're not wrong. One night, I had forgotten to bring my matches to light my fire. I might be an avid camper, but even I don't know how to start a campfire without matches. I had my torch for light, but it was starting to get really cold the closer I got to midnight. I wrapped myself as tightly as I could, but even with two jackets and my sleeping bag, I wouldn't stop shaking. I decided to turn off the flashlight and get some sleep. The sooner I closed my eyes, the sooner it would be daylight and the sun could warm me up. As soon as I turned off the flashlight, I noticed the warm glow shining in the distance. The thickness of the trees made it almost impossible to determine how far away the glow was. I instantly thought it was another camper's fire. There was no way I was going to suffer the cold all night long knowing there was a nearby camper who could spare a match or two. I grabbed my flashlight and walked in the direction of the glow. I didn't walk very far before I got close enough to make out the shape of what looked like a house. I wasn't about to just walk up to a random camper, so I crouched in a bush nearby and peered out towards the warm glow. It wasn't coming from a campfire. In front of me, just past the tree line, there was an old wooden cabin. I was instantly confused. I had hiked that trail and camped in those woods countless times, but I never noticed a cabin before. I lifted my flashlight up and its cold beam split the darkness between me and the warm glow coming from the window of the cabin. In that moment, the glow from within the cabin disappeared and it was flung into the darkness. My flashlight was the only light left. There was absolute silence as I stared at the cabin. My light rested on the door of the cabin, and after a moment of nothing, the door flung open. My light rested on the tall, dark silhouette of a man. He stood in the doorway and looked directly at me. I could hardly breathe. I couldn't move at all. My heart raced in my chest, and the blood rushing to my head was all I could hear. Then, suddenly, a deep whisper broke the silence. Turn it off. The man's voice sounded so cold. It was like a hiss from a snake or a growl from a dog. My instincts kicked in and I ran. I turned off the light and ran through the darkness. I would rather trip over a fallen tree I couldn't see than risk the man from the cabin using the light to follow me. I made it back to my campsite in one piece and jumped into my tent. I zipped it up, threw the sleeping bag over my head, and embraced the cold and the dark for the rest of the night. When morning came, I packed up and got as far away from that place as I could. I didn't want to risk going back to the cabin. I hiked to my car and drove home. That voice was the most horrible sound I have ever heard. It was so cold and dead. The man it belonged to still haunts my dreams, as does that cabin. Story number two, lost but not alone. I got lost in the woods a few years ago. It's not as bad as it sounds. My parents found me around an hour later, but in that short hour of wandering around the woods, something terrifying happened to me. We were in the middle of a move to a whole other state. We'd packed what we could into the car, and then my parents, my brother, and I buckled up for the long drive to our new home. The drive took us down a road that was surrounded by trees and led through the middle of the woods. We'd been driving for most of the day, and we were all a little crabby. So, my dad pulled over and suggested we eat the lunch my mom packed. We all climbed out the car and set up for a picnic in the trees near the road. I needed to use the bathroom not long after we stopped. I was around 14 years old at the time. Anyway, I was old enough to tell my parents that I didn't need them to come with me. I marched into the trees all by myself with the promise that I won't go too far. Long story short, by the time I turned around to head back, I had no idea where I was. I got lost. I started wandering around, calling out for my parents or my brother, but I didn't get a response. I didn't think I went that far, but I probably got even deeper into the woods by trying to find my way back to the road. At some point, I stumbled upon a wood log cabin. It was in really good shape, so I thought that I was saved. I knocked on the door, but there was no answer. I peered through the windows, but it was too dark inside to see anything. Now, the whole time I was walking around looking for my parents, I thought I was both lost and completely alone. I was wrong. I wasn't alone. I didn't know anything about Sixth Sense back then, and I didn't feel like I was being watched. However, when I think about it now, I can remember never feeling at ease. I can remember feeling eyes on the back of my head. As I turned to walk away from the window, I looked at the door again. 
I'm not sure if it was open or closed when I first knocked on it, but when I looked at it again, it was ever so slightly ajar. Through the small sliver, I spotted movement. I froze and stared at the gap in the open door for the longest time. That's when I saw it. The movement was the blinking of an eye that was staring at me through the gap in the open door. Someone was inside the cabin, watching me. I didn't want them to know that I could see them, so I pretended that I didn't notice. I walked past the door as calmly as I could. I expected the door to fly open and for someone to jump out at me. Thankfully, nothing happened. As I walked away from the cabin, I heard a loud bang as the door slammed shut. That was when I ran. I'm not sure how long I was running for, but eventually I found my way back to the road where my parents were screaming my name. I didn't tell them what happened because they were already freaking out enough. We got into the car and I was grateful to drive as far away from that cabin as possible. That eye stared at me, wide and wild. It sent a chill down my spine and still gives me nightmares today. Story number three, winter vacation. I don't go on many vacations at all. I barely earn enough money to get by and afford enough food to last from one paycheck to the next. However, there was this one Christmas that I got a lucky break. A friend of mine was planning on going to a cabin in the woods during Christmas break with her boyfriend, but they had gotten into a fight near the time and ended up not going. She'd already rented the cabin and there was no way she was going to get her deposit back. She had a lot of other things on her mind at the time, so she didn't want to deal with it. I was good enough friends with her that she decided to treat me for Christmas. She gave me the keys and practically told me to take her vacation. I wasn't about to argue. I couldn't remember the last time I had a break. I packed up and drove out to the cabin as soon as I could. The cabin was beautiful. The snow had already started to fall. The lake the cabin sat by was frozen over and it was a tranquil kind of silence out in the woods. I knew I was going to love it. I made sure to enjoy my first night. The fire, the hot chocolate, and the Christmas music really made it a night to remember, but the thing I remember the most was what happened after I went to bed. I was only half asleep when a loud smashing sound woke me up. It sounded like glass shattering. I didn't know what to think, so I turned the lights on and headed downstairs to investigate. As I walked down the stairs, I instantly noticed the collection of glass shards on the floor by the front door. The window beside the door was broken. I didn't instantly think that someone had broken it, otherwise I might have reacted differently. I flung the front door open and peered out into the darkness. I couldn't see anything past the end of the front porch. I got that feeling again. I could feel eyes in the darkness looking back at me. There was a moment of silence, then I heard a deep, distant grunt. Something flew towards me from out of the darkness. I noticed it just in time to duck. Something shot past my head and crashed into the cabin behind me. I glanced over my shoulder to see a large rock roll across the wooden floor. I stared at the rock for a second, and the silence was broken once again by a high-pitched cackle. I slammed the door shut and ran back up the stairs. Someone was out there, and they had just thrown a large rock right at my head. I was on the phone to the police in seconds, but it took them over an hour to get out to me. When they arrived, they searched the whole area. They didn't find anyone, but I wasn't going to stay there. They stayed with me while I packed my stuff and escorted me to a hotel in the town nearby. It was my only vacation in years, and someone tried to kill me. Let's just say I won't be going on another vacation anytime soon. Story number four, one too many drinks. The high school I went to had a little tradition. We were pretty big about our swim team. Whenever our school won a game, the team would go out to this old abandoned cabin in the woods and party. There would be drinks, music, and the one night someone actually built a bonfire that almost burned down the cabin. I wasn't part of the swim team, but one year I started dating someone who was. Obviously, I was there to cheer him on during the match, and he insisted I go with him to the after party when they won. I was never a big fan of parties. I decided to go mainly because I really liked the girl, and I honestly thought that I would get lucky that night. That was the night the team's captain disappeared. I'm not going to use real names for this. So, Mary had been captain of the swim team for three years. Because she was the team captain, she took it upon herself to sort of chaperone the whole party. I kind of felt sorry for her. Everyone else was getting drunk and having a good time, while she was doing her best to keep everything under control. Anyway, I was inside the old cabin at the time, trying to keep some stupid jock's hands off of my girlfriend. We'd all honestly had way too much to drink, and it was probably about to get physical. The only reason it didn't was because of the screams we heard. 
The screams were so horrifying and loud that whoever was playing the music turned it off instantly. We reacted a bit too slowly. The screams were coming from Mary, there was no doubt about it. Everyone ran outside, unsure of what we would find. The screams were in the distance and fading fast. I can hardly remember any part of the night apart from feeling sick in the stomach and lightheaded. I remember running through the woods, chasing down the screams for as long as I could hear them. Eventually, the screams stopped. I was plunged into the silence of the night and the last of Mary's screams faded into the distance. No one has seen or heard from Mary since that night. We all joined the search party and the police combed those woods in the cabin several times. There was no evidence of what happened to her. The theory is that one of the homeless drug addicts that used the cabin as a hideout took her off into the woods and that her body is buried somewhere out there. Honestly, I don't like thinking about it. I only wish I was a little bit less drunk that night, then maybe I would have reacted fast enough to do something. Story number 5. Blood in the Water There's this little cabin in the middle of the woods that I love visiting. It's not secluded or anything, since there's a popular hiking trail and campsite nearby. The reason I love it so much is because of the mountain lake nearby. I would usually rent the cabin for the weekend and then spend my days swimming in the mountain lake. The mountain water is the freshest and cleanest thing ever. I'd go up there early in the morning, before any of the campers or hikers, and just enjoy the water all by myself. One day, in the middle of the summer, the water wasn't as fresh and clean as it seemed. I woke up early, before the sun even started rising, and walked along the trail leading to the mountain lake. I passed a few people on the way, but they were still packing and wouldn't be heading up there anytime soon. When I got there, I noticed the smell instantly. There was a slight breeze, and it brought with it a subtle chemical smell that burned the inside of my nostrils. It wasn't too strong, so I could ignore it and just enjoy my swim. I dived right in. The water felt great. The feeling didn't last very long. I closed my eyes and turned on my back. The world around me became muffled and I allowed my body to float in the still water. It was pure bliss, but that was when it ended. They say that ignorance is bliss, and I was ignorant when I entered the water that morning. As I floated, my head hit something floating in the water beside me. I flinched. It wasn't hard like a rock, but it was solid and large. I pulled my legs down and turned my body the right way up before turning towards whatever I just hit. The loudest scream escaped my mouth as my eyes met that of a deer floating lifeless in the water. I panicked and, for a moment, I forgot how to swim. I was splashing in the water, kicking my legs out. All I wanted was to get away from the deer's dead body. I screamed non-stop. Eventually, some hikers that were on their way to the lake heard me and rushed my way. The next thing I knew, someone was in the water with me and dragging me back to shore. One of the hikers thought I was having trouble swimming and dived in after me. It was only after they got me back to shore did we all realize what was going on. The lake was filled with dead animals. Birds, fish, deer, squirrels, and more were all floating on the lake's surface. That chemical smell was from a nearby plant that had an accident. Their chemicals had spilled into the water and were even in the air, killing most of the animals in the area or who had drunk the water. I was quarantined in that cabin for the rest of the week. I felt ill, but I hadn't ingested any water, so I recovered after a few days. That cabin used to hold so many memories for me. Now I can just smell those chemicals and think about those dead animals in the water. <laughs>